God meant what he said. <laughs> Jerusalem was destroyed. Yes. And that is really what the book of Lamentation is about. Because as Jerusalem was destroyed and besieged by the Babylonians, Jeremiah himself was captured, but he was let go. Everyone else was taken into captivity. And so, what was the first thing that Jeremiah did after he was let go? He went right back to Jerusalem, or what was Jerusalem, and looked at all the ruins around. And he lamented. And he wrote this inspired, beautiful book of Lamentations. In chapter 3 of Lamentations, we find the core of the book. We read it, and the title itself gives it away. Lamentations means to mourn, to grieve, to cry out loud, to be sad. But it pictures everybody what they hope to become, because it gives people hope. And chapter 3 is the core of the book, hope. The chapter describes the destruction of Jerusalem and related events from an extremely personal standpoint. And that personal standpoint being from Jeremiah himself. He is outpouring himself on how he really felt at the same time while explaining how Judah felt, Jerusalem felt. The point of Lamentations that we see here, and the point of the lesson from this morning, is that no matter what direction that you look, God always gives hope. God gives hope in every direction. And from chapter 3, we see that Jeremiah looks at three different directions and how hope was involved in those directions. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a few moments. But God gives hope in every direction. When you start chapter 3, we see that the first direction that Jeremiah was looking was around. Looking around. When he looked around, what did he find? Well, he found the ruin of hope. At least from his personal standpoint. When he looked around, he saw the ruin of hope. <coughs> When you look at verse 1 and following, he says that I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stones. He has made my paths crooked. Verse 10, he is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become the laughingstock of all people, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. Other versions may say, I have forgotten what good is. So, I said, my endurance has perished. So has my hope. <coughs> In the Lord. From the circumstances around him, he saw nothing but the ruin of hope. He saw and felt and was in a painful despair, a very painful despair. Obviously, when you follow along with me as we were reading the first 18 verses, 
That sounded a lot like just pain, despair, discouragement, depression, hurt. In verse 1, he says that I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. Keep in mind the context. Although Jeremiah speaks in first person singular, poetically, he is talking about Judah as well. What he saw is what Judah saw as well during the whole destruction and the besiege of the Babylonians. Babylonians. Jeremiah was devastated both by what he had endured as God's prophet and by what had happened to Judah. If you go back to chapter 1 and read verse 1, he says, How lonely is the city that was, past tense, full of people. He goes on to say in verse 3 that Judah has gone into exile because of affliction. As Jeremiah looked around, he saw nothing but pain, nothing but despair. It seemed as if he was left with no guidance, verse 2 and 3. He was in the dark, no light, nothing, no one to guide him, no protection, verse 4 through 6. He said that there was no escape, verse 7. He said that he was left with unanswered prayers, verse 8, as if God wasn't even hearing them at all. And he was left with no peace whatsoever. Verse 10 through 18. Such affliction and frustration often puts people in a bitter mood, does it not? Notice what he says again in verse 15. He says that he has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. We often don't use that word nowadays in our day-to-day -day conversations, wormwood. What's a wormwood? I always thought for the longest time that the word meant exactly what it says. I thought it was just a bunch of worms on a wood. But what is a wormwood? Well, a wormwood was a poisonous chemical that would infect a city's water system, giving the water a bitter taste and causing affliction to the consumer's body. This was one of the consequences that Israel and Judah faced in their affliction against, uh, during their rebellion from God. Their water was poisoned, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 15, and chapter 23, verse 15. In 120 degrees, one can only live without water for one day. In weather of 60 degrees, one can only live without water for 10 days. Imagine how hot the Middle Eastern was. It gets hot. We think that Arkansas was bad, yeah, 90 degrees with humidity. Feels like it's over 100, 110. But in the Middle East, it gets over 120 degrees. So think about that. When they were rebelled, uh, rebelling against God, he poisoned their water systems. What did they have to do for water? Well, it was part of the consequences for their rebellion. And so Jeremiah uses that affliction as a figure of speech, saying that, yes, I've become bitter because of everything that I've seen, everything that I look around, all the ruin, all the affliction that I had to endure as a prophet, and this is the end of the outcome. Yes, he already knew that, which we're going to talk about again in a few moments, but still, this is how he felt. He goes, all of this happen stance around me put me in a very bitter mood. And as a result, Jeremiah says that my endurance, my strength has perished. I got no more left in me. My hope is gone. He could not even see a glimmer of hope. Judah lost a lot. And when you compare limitations with the very last chapter of Jeremiah, chapter 52, we see all of what it was that Judah had lost. The people lost food and faced starvation. Chapter 1, verse 11 and 19, and compare that with Jeremiah 52, verse 6. 
we see that the allies, their allies, scattered, leaving no security at all. Chapter 1, verse 6, and Jeremiah 52, verse 8. God has always said, even when you start from the book of Samuel through Kings and Chronicles, God has always told his people to never make foreign alliances. God would always get upset with his people whenever they made foreign alliances. Why? Because they're just going to stab you in the back. They're going to forsake you. They're going to leave you when things get rough and tough. They're not going to be there to protect you. I am. I'm your alliance, the Lord says. Stop making foreign alliances. And sure enough, look what happened. Their allies scattered and left them. Left them there to dry and die. They had no security. Their religion was gone. Government was gone. And social life was gone. Lamentations 2, 6 through 9. And compare that to Jeremiah 52, verse 12. Their supplies and treasures were taken and traded. Chapter 1, verse 7 and 11, and Jeremiah 52, verse 17 through 23. Jeremiah almost seems to have been surprised, and he was. But how could a prophet who preached 40 years that if you don't repent, destruction is going to come? Why would he end up being surprised? Well, because now he's seeing it being fulfilled with his very own eyes. For 40 years, he had been announcing what would happen if the people did not listen to the Lord. But the fulfillment of God's prophecies was even worse than he could have imagined. And so yes, he was heartbroken. He was in a painful despair. And when he looked around at what was going on, he only saw the ruin of hope. And folks, how often is it that we relate with Jeremiah? Whenever we look around to the circumstances around our world, around our community, maybe just even within around our life, we see a lot that's going on. A lot of heartaches, a lot of painful despairs. And how often is it that we relate with Jeremiah into thinking that I'm all washed out. I'm wiped out. I got no more in me. My hope is just fading. Well, again, limitations, like Jeremiah, doesn't end on a bad note. Because we see a surprising change of attitude all of a sudden when we look at verse 19 and following, which then brings us as to what Jeremiah had to do in order to see hope again. He had to look up. When he looked up, the direction of up, he found the revival of hope. He had to look up in order to find the revival of hope. In verse 19 through 21, he says, Remember my affliction and my wonders, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore... I have hope. So as he looked up and found the revival of hope, as I said, we find just a startling change of attitude, a change of perspective. How did, did he go from verse 18 saying that my hope is gone in the Lord to verse 21, therefore I have hope? Well, we find a startling change of attitude. We're not sure what brought about this ab abrupt change in attitude. Did Jeremiah pause after writing the words in verse 20? My soul continually remembers and is bowed down within me. And did he think about his relationship with the Lord after he wrote those words? Did the Lord suddenly reveal something in him? Well, we do not know for sure. But here is a very logical possibility on how this abrupt change in attitude came about in the context. In verse 18, look at verse 18. In verse 18, Jeremiah referred to the Lord. See that phrase, the Lord. In verse 19, he asked him to remember his affliction. 
In verse 20, he says that his soul continually remembers all the terrible things that happened. And then in verse 21, the two concepts, the Lord and remembering, perhaps came together. And he called to mind, uh, verse 21, that is he remembered a precious truth about the Lord. Two concepts, the Lord and remembering, most likely just came to mind, and he remembered a precious truth about the Lord. And what precious truth is that, that, that he recalled to mind? Well, it is known to be as Israel's national anthem. We find in verse 22 through 24, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Notice that we've already seen the word hope several times, more than three times at least. This is the precious truth. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. The sentiment is prominent throughout the history of the Jewish nation of the Lord's steadfast love. In the book of Psalms, which spans much of Israel's history, this wondrous, precious truth is found throughout the volume. Of special note, I would say, it is found in Psalm 136, which surveys of God's dealing with mankind in general and with Israel in particular. <coughs> The phrase, his steadfast love, is found and used in every verse over 26 times in Psalm 136. In Lamentations, we see, in the midst of affliction and bitterness, Jeremiah recalled this faith-affirming truth. He remembered he remembered that the Lord is loving. He remembered that the Lord is loving. He said his steadfast love never ceases. Now in Hebrew, the phrase steadfast love is one word, and it's used over 250 times in the Old Testament alone. The steadfast love that he speaks about is very relatable to the covenant commitment love that God has to his children. And it's basically equivalent to the agape love in the New Testament. The foreign nations spoke of their gods as mighty and powerful, even vengeful. Only the Israelites spoke of their God as loving. Verse 32 of Lamentations 3, look what it says. It says, Though he caused grief, he will have compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. God's wrath is with measure, but his steadfast love is without measure. Like the burning bush in Exodus 3, it is never consumed. God loves one child as much as another, and he loves each child of his as if he or she were the only one he ever created to love. That is why he pleads for every erring child to return to him so that he can pour his steadfast love over them. And that is what God begs Israel to do during that time. And that is what he begs spiritual. Israel, the church, his children who have strayed away. That's what he begs them to do, is to come back, repent, so that I can pour out my steadfast love all over you. He also remembered that the Lord is merciful. He goes on to say that his mercies never come to an end. Notice that. The steadfast love, it never ceases. It pours out more and more and more. His mercies, likewise, never come to an end. 
The Lord is consistent in his compassions. They never fail. Even as we have a new day each morning, so we have a new, fresh supply of mercy every morning, <coughs> Jeremiah says. But how sure can we be of God's mercy and compassion? Well, as sure as the sun rises each day, that sure is the compassion of God. Now, a skeptic may, ar may argue that, well, okay, well, what if it's cloudy outside? Big rain cloud. And it's pouring down rain and whatnot, and we can't even see the sun. Well, yes, that is true. But we still know that there is a sun just beyond those dark clouds, do we not? So, yes, even during those dark days, dark days where there's dark clouds over your head, always remember that the sun is still shining on the other side. And as every storm has an end, the storms that we face has an end as well. In God's compassion, even when it is not readily seen, we can be confident that it is still there. Every day has its problems. Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. But every day also has God's presence. Jeremiah remembered the Lord is merciful. And he also remembered that the Lord is faithful. He says, great is your faithfulness, verse 23. Now, a sinful world would know little about faithfulness. Many seem unconcerned about keeping their word. Last Sunday evening, did we not talk about that section on the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus talks about not swearing, not making oaths, just be a person of your word, right? Well, the Pharisees and people of the world, they know little about that. If you don't believe me, just look around at all the car companies, all the industries where you have to always have some kind of contract. Why are there contracts? Why do we have to make a vow when we sign our signature with those contracts? Well, because people in the world, they don't keep their word. It's sad that we've gotten to that point. And it's frustrating, especially when each contract keeps getting thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker, and you got to read through every single one of them. Ugh, it's frustrating. But it's because the world that we live in, they don't know about keeping their word. They don't know about faithfulness. A prime example of this can also be in our marriages. Some people go into and out of marriage. Now, in the Lord's Church, it is not uncommon for couples to have been married for 50, 60, or even 70 years. But those that live in the world, that's very rare. The sinful world knows little of faithfulness, but the Lord is faithful to his covenant commitments. Because again, a covenant, just like in a marriage, that is us with our Lord, our Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ. He has made that covenant. Jesus is the husband, the church is his bride, and we have that covenant. And he is faithful to that covenant. He keeps his word. He keeps his promises. When he says that you will get through the storm, you'll get through it. Keep your faith and trust in him. When he says that there's a way of an escape, there's a way of an escape. He keeps his word. He keeps his promises. Each time we see a rainbow in the sky, what are we reminded of? The world is reminded of, oh, the day when homosexuality was legalized and federally speaking, nationally speaking, and now homosexuals can get married. Well, yeah, in the eyes of the world, that is. But when we see things through the eyes of God with wisdom from above, we're reminded, when we, every time we see a rainbow, we're reminded of the promise that God made with Noah in Genesis chapter 9, that he will never, ever destroy the world again through a global flood. And since then, have we ever had a global flood? No. God keeps his promises. In Jeremiah chapter 52, verse 31 through 34, the prophet ends his book explaining that in the 37th year of exile, Jehoiachin, king of Judah, was graciously freed from prison and given a position of power. 
Why would he end his prophetic book on that note? Why mention that? Well, it's not because of what a scholar so-and-so today say. Oh, well, there was more than, you know, one writer for the book of Jeremiah. There was about four or five different writers and editors of the book of Jeremiah. No. Jeremiah ended his book on that note with a message of hope. That's why. Because guess what happened? In the 37th year of exile... Jehoiachin was released and given a position of power. It is a confident expectation that would someday fulfill the prophecies of a return of God's people to their homeland. And from the account of Ezra and Nehemiah, the books that we have in the Old Testament, God's people had risen, repented, returned, and restored. Did God keep his promise? He kept his promise, folks. And today, through Jesus, you and I are recipients of that covenant made over four or five thousand years ago in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. The God who cannot lie has made promises to us, Titus chapter 1, verse 2, the hope of eternal life. That through the seed of Abraham, all nations of the earth will be blessed. That seed was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. God kept his word, folks. Were it not for his faithfulness, we could have no confidence in our salvation. Jeremiah remembered, God is faithful. And on top of that, he remembered how great his faithfulness really is. When disasters come, God's faithfulness remains. When you fail, God's faithfulness is there. When you make bad choices about life, God's faithfulness remains when your marriage falls apart, when your business goes bankrupt, when your children rebel and forsake your counsel, God's faithfulness remains constant. It never, never, never diminishes. The fact that God's truth can never be broken is bracing to the heart and comforting to the soul. Jeremiah, therefore, says, I will hope in him. Verse 24. And so, seeing that his hope is now revived, what is he to do next? Well, he's got to look forward. When hope is revived, it encourages you to move and look forward, giving you the reassurance of hope. And this is the remainder of the chapter. It has an element of looking forward. Jeremiah was reassured that some would come back into the homeland, out of captivity. This is important for us to understand when it comes to moving forward and having the reassurance of hope because it reminds us about the need for reassurance. Folks, we need reassurance, do we not? Right now, from this lesson, talking about hope, I'm giving everyone reassurance. <coughs> Why? Because we need it. We need it from time to time. And that's what Jeremiah needed. When you look at verse 31 through 33, he's given that need of reassurance. He says, For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. Perhaps we might think of a loving father who disciplines his child with tears in his eyes. It broke God's heart to punish his people, to grieve them. He did not want to do it, but they had brought it on themselves. However, he wanted them to know that he was always ready to forgive and to receive them back, as expressed right there in verse 32. That is a need of reassurance that Jeremiah needed and that we need today. But then also, when we look forward... And see the reassurance of hope. It also explains to us about the need for restoration. It explains to us about how we need restoration. In verse 25 and 26, he says that the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of 
the Lord. What is it that Israel needed to do in order to receive that compassion, that mercy? Well, the people needed to test and examine their ways and return to the Lord. Verse 40, he says, let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. That is what they needed to do in order to receive that compassion and that mercy and that forgiveness. Now, what did this specifically involve? When we test and examine our ways, what does it specifically involve? Well, I mean, obviously, we can look all over the passages of uh, the Bible and look at all different examples, but let's look at what Jeremiah says about it. Jeremiah gives a few specifics on what it is that we need to do when it comes to testing and examining our ways. Part of it, number one, is that we need to wait quietly and seek earnestly. Verse 25 and 26. He says that we need to wait quietly and seek earnestly. This is reminiscent of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20, where the prophet there says that the Lord's in his holy temple, let all the earth be silent, same Hebrew word, before him. Psalm 37, verse 7 says, be still before the Lord and wait quietly for him. Waiting quietly means waiting without complaining. Verse 39 of Lamentations 3. We often get frustrated with waiting, do we not? <laughs> we have a hard time being patient. A lot of us do, including myself. We often get uh, in a hurry when the Lord is not. But however, these verses do not call for passive waiting. This waiting is active. In our text, notice how waiting is used interchangeably with seeking. It means that we need to have and show submissive obedience to the Lord. Waiting patiently and seeking Him earnestly means submissive obedience. It means submissive obedience. God cannot always respond immediately to our situation or prayers because of broad designs of His eternal purpose. While we wait for the fullness of time to come, we seek to do His will, looking to Him with trusting obedience. Waiting patiently and seeking Him earnestly also means that we have an eager, longing hope. Waiting quietly rests upon God's reliability. The faithful anticipate with confidence, knowing that they will see the fulfillment of His promises. When God says that you have an inheritance waiting for you in heaven, what does he mean by that? He means that you're going to have it. You're going to receive it. If you continue on waiting patiently and seeking me, doing my will, you will have it. Like Jeremiah and the people of his day, we need to learn to wait. Wait quietly. Hope, trust, and obey. We also see in verse 20 through 30 that they needed to surrender themselves totally to the Lord. Notice in verse 19, we have this command, verse 29, we have this command. Let him put his mouth in the dust. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. What does that mean? Does that mean that we literally ought to go outside and Grab up some of the dirt and shove it in our mouths? No. Having one's mouth or face to the dust was a sign of humility. It's a figure of an individual falling prostrate with his face on the ground expressing total submission to the one before whom he was bowing out of total humility. They needed to be honest in their dealings, verse 34 through 36. God is not unjust, and neither should they be. They also needed to stop complaining, verse 37 through 39. And they also, out of their greatest need, was to confess their sin and pray, throw themselves on the mercy of the Lord. 
verse 40 through 42. And if they would do that, God would hear their prayers and again draw near to them. Verse 55 through 58. That, my friends, is hope. We have the same hope today through Jesus Christ. Yes, at times when we look around, we may see nothing but ruin. Obstacles and devastations and despair that only tries to break our hope. But like Jeremiah, we need to remember. Remember who? Remember the Lord. And remember that great, precious truth that even though, as we look around, we see ruin, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. Therefore, I will hope in Him. When we do that, folks, our hope will be revived. And when it's revived, it gives us the motivation and the encouragement to move and to look forward, knowing that we have the reassurance of hope, and knowing that we need restoration as long as we do what it is that He wants us to do. Wait quietly before Him and seek Him earnestly. His mercies never come to an end, folks. But suffering does. Suffering comes to an end. If not in this life, then in the next. The hope that we have that's given to us through Jesus Christ is the hope of eternal life that He promised us. And He promised a return of His people out of captivity, and it happened. He promises us eternal life and inheritance, everlasting joy, where there's no more sorrow, no more pain. Heaven, folks, is what I'm talking about. If he is the God of his word in the old days, he's still a God of his word today, folks. Do you want that? I do. Well, if we want it that bad, then if we have sin in our life, we've got to get rid of it. Maybe there's one here who's never obeyed the gospel yet. And they need to believe and repent, confess their faith in Jesus Christ, and to have their sins washed away through baptism, to be saved, to be forgiven, to be added to the church, and to have that hope. Maybe there's one here this morning who is a Christian, who has made a mistake or fallen short, or having some kind of struggle of temptation. Maybe you're going through a painful despair, like Jeremiah, over the circumstances in your life. Maybe your hope is fading out, and you need that encouragement. Well, prayers of the church, of your brothers and sisters here, can help you and support you. The prayer of a righteous man is very effective. Did we not talk about that in our James class? Well, if you need anything whatsoever, the prayer of a righteous man will be very powerful for you. Because the power comes from the source of the Almighty God. So if you have any need, I encourage you, please come forward together as we stand and as we sing. Just as I